Today on this old house, this is the Edisto River, and it's about 45 minutes from Charleston. And today, our lumberjack, well, he's not wearing flannel, he's wearing scuba gear. What happened to all this plumbing here? I've never seen anything like this before. There's already rot going on in that trunk. So what have you found up here? Well, a bit of a surprise. It's really the classic plumber's lament. Nice, nice. Here is right on. Ooh, and the smell just changed. That's bad guano. Oh, lovely. Now it's your turn to save it for the next generation. <laughs> the money's in the detail. Oh, that is beautiful. Hi there. I'm Kevin O'Connor, and welcome back to this old house here in Charleston, South Carolina. Hey, Manuel. Hello, Kevin. So we are working on two projects in the city. They're both in the historic district, and they both need a ton of work. Here at our Charleston single, our homeowner, Scott, is working with our architect, and I'm told they have a very unusual idea. Hey, Scott, Bill, how are you guys? Hey, Hi, Kevin. Kevin how Look are you? at the progress you've made on the kitchen house. Huh? Floor is gone and you broke through to the main house. This is going to be a great space. Yeah, I think so. It is. We need to utilize it to its fullest. Right. We're having a bit of a challenge because this is going to be the primary dining room mm -hmm. and some entertaining. So we've come up with uh, a special table to fit within the room. Nice. Uh, we have the table actually set up for two modes. There's an entertaining mode and a dining mode. So sort of a half circle here, this is entertaining mode? This is entertaining mode. Yeah. Uh, so that there'll be able, be able to be people here uh, and Scott can be serving wine or yeah. having guests and there'll be easy access to the outside. Mm -hmm. We also have dining mode, oh, which cool. are the same two pieces but oriented differently in more of a serpentine pattern yeah. so that the family can sit together uh, and dine. Yes, yeah, Scott, you can sit right there, look at the family, and that'll go right down the middle of this uh, space. What do you yeah. think? I, I love the way it utilizes this long, narrow space yeah. that we have because we wanted to save these two fireplaces. So okay. it's a challenge, and I think it looks great. Very cool. And another special feature, uh, you can see it's going to be made out of wood, and that's mm -hmm. a special feature because I'm thinking of a special kind of wood. Really? Well, what are you thinking? An old growth cypress. Nice. And there's only one place to get it. Which is? The bottom of a river. Uh oh. <laughs> All right. You got a river in mind? You got a guy? I got a guy, and we're going to, uh, he's already identified the log. We're going to go and get the log and. Make I the am table. I'm all over that, man. If you know a guy, that sounds like a great idea. I'm all in. So I want to check that out. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Kevin. This is the Edisto River, and it's about 45 minutes from Charleston. And today, our lumberjack, well, he's not wearing flannel, he's wearing scuba gear, because we are looking for wood that has been sunk in these waters for decades. Justin Harrington. Oh, hi, Justin, how are you? Doing fine, how about yourself? I'm doing all right. This is a beautiful spot this you guys got here. And uh, this is quite the get up. So what is the process for finding these? Well, we're heading up river right now to try and find an old cypress log. So tell me about the river. I mean, how deep are we generally through here? Generally speaking, right now with the rainfall, we've had probably four or five feet, some places maybe eight. So what That's are we looking stuff. for? It's Cypress, obviously, but I mean, we're looking for old stuff. So where did it come from and how did it get to the bottom of this river? Well, the old stuff that we're looking for was stuff that was probably maybe standing when Christopher Columbus came over, the Spaniards came over and first wow. explored here. Um, so you got a tree that could be several hundred years old when it was alive. Yes. that went into this river and has been in this river for another couple hundred years. Yes, sir, exactly. That is a precious piece of wood. And some of the natural fallen trees we find could potentially be thousands of years old. Wow. So you think this is the spot? Well, I was out here a few days ago with my sonar and located quite a few logs right in this little general area. Yep. And the one that we're going to go after today is right out here. I'm going to suit up, go down, see if I can't get a rope around it uh, and a chain, see if we can tie the barge to it. All right. And, uh, Find Hold some, it up and see what happens. Let's do it. Let's find some cypress. Got some bubbles right here on the left pontoon. You got it. Come on. Justin finds the log. He has actually attached himself to it by a line. And now the pontoon boat has literally come right up over him so they can drop the winch line, which he grabbed. And now his challenge is in near pitch black to get that line and those tongs onto our log. Current's ripping. Hard to keep the boat stable. Justin wants to float right past us. He's fighting it. Me up. up. Here we 
Got it up off the bottom, now I need to move these tongs this way. All right, so he's got the tongs actually on the tree. Yeah, give me a chain, give me a chain, I can get that under it. He's lifted it up enough that he can get a chain underneath it, which is what he's doing right now. You got a hook right there? Let's hang it from a chain, let's hang it from a chain. Take the tongs, put the cable around, put it up higher. Gotcha. Put it up the middle. You got it. What do you got? I just pulled a, pulled a piece of uh, that log off and uh, definitely cypress. What's it smell like? It smells like money. Justin, you had to cut that bell off to get it out of the river, which was unfortunate, but it does give you a view right here. Now that you've had a chance to look at it, what do you know? Well, judging by that end being cut square and the way that this was, I believe it to have been an axe cut log. Mm -hmm. uh, Any guess looking at this as how old the tree was when it was cut? We could spend some time and count these growth rings, but I would guess this is 150, maybe 200 years old. When it was at, cut? At the time of cut. Um, if I had to guess, judging by the, the period that uh, they were logging here, 150, 200 years. And then how long do you think it was in the river? 150 years probably. So we're looking at 300, Easily. 500 year old tree? Yes, this is an old tree. So you're happy? I'm very happy. Well, let's I'm glad we mill. got it home safely. Nobody got hurt. Let's get it to the mill. Let's take it. Want to tackle all your home improvement projects with confidence? Join This Old House Insider, a new streaming service from This Old House, the iconic Emmy-winning series that inspired a generation of home enthusiasts. Stream over 1,000 episodes of This Old House and Ask This Old House commercial-free. Watch it all in the This Old House app. And join live online Q&As with our experts. Best of all, you can try Insider free for seven days. To join, go to thisoldhousemembership.com. Well, Kevin, let's see if we can get that log we found earlier cut into boards. I have confidence in you, Justin. It has taken a lot of work to get this sinker up on here, but this is a good feeling, right? It sure is. I'm glad to have it home. All right. What we're going to do now is take this bandsaw, this horizontal bandsaw. We're going to take and whittle it down and try to get some two-inch slabs out of it. Let's do it. All right, we made our first cut. So you know, let's push it off and see what we got. What do you think? Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, it is. It really is. A little wind shake, they call it. Yep. So this is really wet. Soft and wet, so we're going to have to let it dry for a long time before we turn it into your table. All right, well, I can't wait. Justin, thank you very much. Yes, that sir. was an adventure. <laughs> I'm glad you made it. I love it. Yes, sir. Charleston is hot. Real estate, restaurants, and temperature, and today is no exception. Now for nine months a year, the average high temperature here is 70 degrees and above. And this town was actually built before air conditioning or even indoor plumbing was ever considered. Our homeowners want to take this beautiful building and restore it to its original state, but they also want to be cool. So they stripped away the plaster in this beautiful room and the homeowners saw all the brick and said, I love it, I want to keep it. So, what does that mean? It means there's no two by four walls, there's no room for insulation, no room for ductwork. But it also means that there's no insulation, the sun can beat on this brick and it acts like a radiator. And that means more gain, more solar load to the building. Now they also opened up the ceilings and look what they found. Perfect beams that they want to keep. Now that means if they're going to leave them exposed, we can't run ductwork inside the joist space. So for us, this beautiful building is an HVAC nightmare. But I think we have a solution. And the solution for us here is a mini duct system. We've used them before, and Brad Schwartz is helping us with this installation today. How do yes, you sir. deal with this heat? It's rather warm in Charleston. <laughs> Learn so, to love it. So why is this a good choice here? Space. We uh, are conventional systems, and we do a lot of them. Uh, we're limited. Our air handlers are larger. Yeah. Our supply trunks are larger. Yeah. 
Uh, this system would take a 14 inch supply trunk versus this seven inch That's supply. Right. Right. Uh, the runs would be six to seven, eight inches. Yeah. These are two inch. That's great. So we have a time constraint, our, our size is everything in here in these old homes. Good. We don't have rooms to build big closets and, and take up spaces. Right. The way the system works is there's one return per system. So there's a return that sits here in the second floor hallway, air comes up through a filter, through this flexible return. Now this has got a sound attenuating material on the inside, comes across this first section, which is a cooling coil or a heating coil, depending on what season you're in. The way it works, there's a refrigerant coil right here. Now with a mini duct system, you've got less air across a colder, deeper coil. And that means the net net is that you remove much more humidity. Humidity is a big deal here. Huge. And then once you get that water, you've got to deal with it. So you've got a condensate trap, and you've got a secondary safety pan so you don't flood the house below it. The blower unit is what pushes it out to the ductwork. Inside this module right here is a very smart motor. It's an ECM blower motor, and that pushes just the right amount of airspeed into this one size supply trunk. So you're pressurizing the entire main at the same time, and the key to make it quiet is these sound attenuators. And that's the, really the key to the system. You can see inside here, there are two inches on the inside, and it's a special spun nylon material to really act as a muffler to make it quiet as a mouse. But now we have to connect the attenuator to okay. the main trunk. Put that on. A conventional ducted system works on the concept of diffuse and throw. Air comes out gently out of a register and just falls, if it's cooler, to the floor. This system works by aspiration. It's a stream of air coming down and blending the rest of the air in the room together. So it means if you put these in the room, you have no more than a two degree temperature difference side to side and top to bottom. So then the only question is where do you put them? And so we want to make sure that we don't blow them on top of anybody, like over a bed or a pillow. So in our case, we're going to be right here underneath that knee wall. And there's all kinds of choices in what you'll see. Here's the conventional finish right here. And that would normally go against a plastered ceiling. But in the floors, which we'll have on the first floor, there's all kinds of different wood finishes. There's pine. There's some oaks. There's a chrome. They also make a brass. Sometimes in tile, we'll see people use this, where they'll put this down inside the tile floor, or they'll use this as a plaster bead with a plastered ceiling. They also make this. This is a slotted outlet that can fit into a tight sidewall. So if you had a two by four wall, it can come out through here. Here's the conventional finish, but they also make outlets in all kinds of woods. So you can really make this thing go away and you can be comfortable. Now you can watch this old house and ask this old house anytime, anywhere. Download our new app to stream full episodes to your tablet, your TV, and your phone. Binge on classic episodes, catch up on recent renovation, and get step-by-step -step help projects all around the house. Best of all, it's free. The most trusted home improvement information is now available on your Amazon Fire TV, Roku, Apple TV, iOS, and Android devices. Download the This Old House streaming app today. Now that work has begun on our single house, we wanted to learn more about its style and its history. Bill, good to see you. Good to see you, Kevin. So you are very familiar with the style house. Yes, Kevin. There are over 2,500 of these in Charleston. Uh, at one point, there were upwards to 5,000. And we see them all across the city. They are everywhere. So tell us about the style. Well, the floor plan is the main signature style of this building. It's one room wide, two rooms deep, with a center stair hall. This being the center entrance right you hear you talking about. Correct, right. correct. Another distinguishing feature is the piazza that we're standing on. These beautiful porches. They are. What makes it special is this. It's called the piazza screen. Mm -hmm. It looks like a doorway into the house, but actually it enters the porch, the yeah. piazza. Bit of an illusion, right? It is, but it's also a chance for architectural expression. Sure. As well as the piazza itself. Which is just awesome. I mean, these things are great. They are. And I notice in this neighborhood, at least, it seems that all the houses are made out of brick. I mean, the main houses, the piazzas are wood, obviously. Is that typical? Well, for this neighborhood, it is. This neighborhood was a part of a great fire in Charleston, burned about a quarter of the city in 1853. Wow. However, many other parts of the city have wood clapboard houses of this style. Would you like to see one? I'd love to. So here we have a neighborhood of wood frame clabbered homes. Yep. This was actually built after our project house. Well, I recognize the form, right? So here's our one room wide, two stories high, piazza screen right here, 
And that shows us, there it is, that beautiful piazza. Exactly, but you will notice this piazza is actually partially enclosed. Right, and so it sort of changes the effect of the building, right? How it do you does. guys feel about that? Well, our city has a Board of Architectural Review. It's mm -hmm. been in place since 1931. Hence all the beautiful homes. Uh, correct. If we tried to do this today, we wouldn't be allowed to do it. Uh, you guys frown on it? They do. However, this condition is grandfathered. And how about our house? Because we've got the same thing. We do. We've grandfathered that condition, so we're fine. Okay. I have one more house I want to show you. It's really pretty special. So, Kevin, here it is. Wow. This is the Thomas Hayward Jr. house. That's a single house. It is. Built in 1803. As you can see, the detailing is quite ornate here. It's a neoclassic style. And you can see the screen on the front of the piazza is very highly detailed. Right. A very distinct feature here. And who was Hayward? Thomas Hayward Jr. was actually a signer of the Declaration of Independence. No kidding. Yes, and a member of the Continental Congress. Woo, and we get to go inside? We do. Let's go. Well, let's do it. Oh, wow. Now that's a piazza. <laughs> it is. But you can see the scale is much bigger, but the proportions are the same. Okay. Also, look at this neoclassic doorway. Yeah, very ornate. Isn't it beautiful? Let's go inside. So, Kevin, here we have four floors. Wow. <laughs> but as you can see, it's still a Charleston single plan with a center stair hall mm -hmm. and two rooms. This front room would be an entertaining parlor. Oh, my. It's a this lot nicer a... than our front room. <laughs> yeah, it is. This will be the dining room. You can see the dinner parties going on in there. This is spectacular. Let's go up because the second level is really where the guests would have been received. So this is the main parlor of the house. Look at this Also room. used as a music room, primarily for entertaining. How tall are these ceilings? 16 feet. Unbelievable. Fantastic for ventilation. Imagine the heat staying high. Yep. And also, light with these large windows, probably 10 feet tall. Oh, I'd say so at least, right? And look at this, a return panel that actually is what we call an embrasured shutter. So you open that, put it over the window to keep out the sun and the heat, but when you tuck it away, you could just open up that window and the ventilation must be incredible. Exactly, and look at the height of the window. We can actually walk through this window out onto the piazza. Hmm. And the rest of layout is what we've seen. The kitchen house in the back is used for cooking and laundry activities. So this single style house, as you guys call it, this is the sort of quintessential Charleston style. It is. It's the indigenous Charleston architectural style. And it's used everywhere from a tenement house to a grand home like this. Right, including ours. So I'm, I'm just thrilled to see how ours turns out. We are as well. All right. weeks ago our arborist Bob Long took a look at our crepe middle tree and decided it could be saved. He's here today with his crew to do the work. So Bob, how do you get started? Hey, good to see you Roger. Good to see you. Well what we've got is the pruning crew has arrived. We got them safely set up, got a line set in the tree. We're making some pruning cuts from the ground as well as some pruning cuts aloft. So there's a great crepe myrtle here but it's masked by a hackberry tree. And so we're going to remove the hackberry tree so that we can reveal the beauty of the crepe myrtle. Great. That worked out pretty well. It did. We've made the final cut, the basil cut. We've gotten this section of the tree out. We've got this other section of the hackberry tree. It's actually loosened up from the crepe myrtle a bit. We can make one more finishing cut on the hackberry tree. There will be a section of hackberry wedged between the stems of the crepe myrtle. Yeah, but that should rot rather quickly. You can come by and check it and pull it out once that, it rots. That's right. Bob, thanks. Great job. Thank you, Roger.
invasive trees are not the only pests here. I found another problem, termites. And they're everywhere in this house. They were in our single house and also in the Elliott Burrow house right here. And look at this, they're in the floors. They just ate the floor away. You can see them in the floor, you can see them in the structure, and you can see them outside. Hey Chris, so you're a termite expert and you're gonna help us with our problem. Yes sir. And to me, it looks like a pretty serious problem. It definitely is. This house has had massive termite damage. And you can actually see from the studs themselves, you can actually yeah. see the dirt coming up. Yeah, the dirts are caused by them. I mean, they just leave this little debris behind. Yep, these are subterranean termites. So they actually have to come from the ground up to the house, which is why they actually bring the dirt with them. I see. They have to maintain a certain moisture content to survive. So this is the sill that was taken out. Now it does, it looks pretty bad, but when you turn it over, oh my gosh, that is yeah, really Yeah, they have basically bad. shredded this whole thing. Yeah. And it's actually quite amazing because you can see down here where it was the original size and they've whittled it down all the way to this. Okay, so now the yeah. new sill is pressure treated. Is that gonna protect us against the termites? It will help, but it's not going to completely prevent termites uh, getting into the structure. So, so you're still gonna have to treat that? Yes, we still will definitely have to treat it. So here's a piece of the uh, sill was cut out. Yep, and you can actually see, you can see the mud tubes that are on it, but yep. it looks pretty, you know, looks pretty sturdy, still seems pretty solid. But if you come over here, this is actually what it looks on the oh inside. Oh boy. Yeah, they just get in there and they just eat what they wanna eat, don't they? Yep, they just had field day in here. And you could see this all day in different termite situations where you can have, you can have wood that looks solid, but is definitely not structurally sound. Yeah, you can't see the damage. They do a massive amount of damage. All right, so how are you gonna treat them? All right, so basically what we have to do to treat them is we have to employ several different uh, methods. What we need to do is we actually need to do a chemical treatment, a liquid treatment around the base of the house. So in the ground? In the ground. What yep. we do is we actually dig a trench, six inch by six inch, and we actually fill that trench with the termiticide. Mm -hmm. And so that's the initial treatment. Then what we actually have to do is when they finish replacing all the wood that they're going to replace in there, we actually go in there with a chemical, uh, it's a borate chemical. So all the new stuff will get yep. treated also. Yep. So what are you doing with the new uh, foundation out there where it's blocked? Well, what we're going to have to do out here is basically we're going to have to trench, uh, do a six inch by six inch trench. Around all of them? Yep, around the base of all of them. And then we're actually going to have to fill the interior because it's not poured yet with, with termiticide. I see. So then you'll treat that in there and then they'll fill it with concrete and then that'll protect any termites from coming up inside because that's out of the sunlight in there. Yeah, because uh, they'll only need is a small crack. So if we did not treat this and there was a small crack in that concrete, once it dried, they could just come right up to the house. Yeah, that's not good. <laughs> All right. Well, great. I can highly wait to see you do some work here. All right. Thank you. All right. So what do you think, Tommy? About as bad as we've ever seen in terms of termite damage? It is pretty bad. And down here in Charleston, according to Chris, it's not a question if your house has termites, the question is when will they have termites? Well, when you see that kind of damage, it really makes you want to think about getting the treatment. Oh, absolutely. All right, so next time, we're going to be start putting in some new old floors in our Singles House Guest Suite. Right, and I'm going to revisit the American College of Building Arts to check on the progress of our iron gates. Very cool. All right, so until then, I'm Kevin O'Connor. And I'm Tom Silva. For this old house here in Charleston. My nasty little buggers. Yeah. Next time on This Old House. It's time for rough plumbing in a house that was never designed for plumbing. So do you think about actually having the toilet? Wouldn't it have been easier if it was over here? Because the joists go this way, right? Yep. What if that went there? It'd be a much easier spot to plumb. Okay. But this is the layout that the homeowner wanted. Oh, and the owner's always right. Would you lay a new floor without subflooring? Well, if you were working with inch thick hard pine, you might. And we start work on our iron gate for a Charleston project. Thanks for watching. This old house has got a video for just about every home improvement project, so be sure to check out the others. And if you like what you see, click on the subscribe button. Make sure that you get our newest videos right in your feed.